Welcome back. Uh, this is the second in a series of messages called uh, Christianity 101. And uh, this is a not a basic class about Christian faith, but this is taught by the Apostle Paul uh, from his famous work, uh, the Book of Romans. Uh, the format is uh, I'll talk for a few minutes. I'll ask you a couple questions where you turn to somebody in your group and, and discuss it. I hope you'll come to uh, your gathering prepared using our church journal. Uh, that will prepare you. If you've read that and written some things down, you'll come prepared. And my hope is that kind of you would uh, break that up into five, six days of the week where you spend 10 minutes with God and read a little bit and write a little bit and pray. And, and then I think you'll really grow in your faith. So I'd like you to open uh, your Bibles to Romans 1, 18 to 32. If you're using uh, a, uh, a cell phone, uh, it's going to be the NIV, okay? And we're going to look at Romans chapter 1, 18 to 32. Uh, the first verse says, there was verse 18, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So it starts off and says, the wrath of God. And some people read that and think, oh my goodness, God is wrathful? Uh, he tells us not to be angry, but he's angry. Well, this is not to be understood as a, a temper tantrum by God. It's God's wrath is his settled disposition against sin. God is holy. He's perfect. And we in sin can't enter into his presence. So his wrath is his disagreement with all sin in the world. Now, who's his wrath uh, addressed against? Verse 19, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Uh, his wrath is against those who know about God. And he suggests all people can know about God from looking at creation. It's all around us. God's divine power and his attributes. Now, this is the first crisis of secularism. I'm calling uh, this week's study the crisis of secularism. The first crisis is that secularists, by definition, believe that there is no God. All that there is is the natural world. Uh, we as humans don't, we're just physical bodies. We don't have a soul or a spirit when we die we return to the earth. This belief is counterintuitive to most people in the world, and increasingly. The thinking of secularism over the years has been that the more you educate people, the less they'll rely on religion. In other words, more people are educated, religion will die away. But Pew Research did a study in April of 2015, and uh, the title of it was in the Washington Post was, People Are Believing More in God, Not Less. And this just kind of blew uh, the whole world of secularism up. Like, what? how can that be? Well, it turns out that we estimate conservatively 100,000 people are becoming Christians every day. And many people are becoming Muslims every day. And one of the basic reasons for this uh, growth is because the Christian birth rate and the Muslim birth rate, they're growing, but the secularist birth rate is declining. Uh, and so the, the belief that this world is all there is and there's no God doesn't really resonate with most people uh, in the world. Um, so the, the, the crisis is further exasperated by the fact that a typical secularist will demand proof. If you say you believe in God, they say, well, prove it. You can't prove there's God. Well, yeah, they're right. You can't prove in an empirical sense that there's God. But the crisis is that they demand that sort of proof for belief in God, but they don't demand that proof for other things that can't be proven that they believe in. They believe that the world evolved. That can't be proven. That's a theory. That hasn't been proven. We've never proven uh, evolution from a lower species to a higher species. Uh, 
around the world. Uh, secularists believe in humans ought to get justice. They ought to have human rights. You can't prove those things. You say, well, well why? Why, why? Why believe that if there's no God? So I'd like you to turn to your neighbor or neighbors in your group and discuss for just a moment, have you experienced what I'm calling this crisis in secularism, uh, the belief that there's only a natural world and uh, that when we die, that's the end, and this demand for proof, prove to me that you have a God when they don't demand that proof for other things. All right, the second crisis of secularism is the belief that there are no moral absolutes. There's no God, so there are no moral absolutes, no right and wrong. But you find around the world, people who would call themselves secularists have this belief that all humans ought to have justice and human rights. And Well, you say, well, where does that come from? If you say there's no God and we just evolve from worthless molecules, what's to say anything's right? One thing's better than another. How can you, know, how can you demand uh, these things of other people? And they really don't have an answer. But God answers that question uh, through the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1. Uh, if you're following along with me, this is Romans 1.24. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to secular, sexual impurity. So three times Paul says God gave them over. In other words, when we decide we don't believe in God, then God gives us over to moral corruption. So this is the crisis in uh, secularism today. Secularis secularists don't believe in God, don't believe in moral absolutes, but they can't stand the increasing moral corruption in the world. And so they demand that uh, you know, there ought to be human rights, there ought to be justice. And uh, uh, Verse 26, Paul says it again, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Verse 28, he says it the third time, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. Then he ends uh, his uh, section uh, in verse 32. He says, Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. So Paul says the bottom rung of the ladder is not only do they, does the world become more and more socially and morally corrupt, but people approve of people doing that, and they applaud them. And so in the end, what used to be evil is now good. And what used to be good is now evil. So I'd like you to turn to your neighbor again. Uh, this is my last question today is, you know, have you experienced that? Where good and evil have been kind of turned on their heads, where what's good is now celebrated as wonderful, and what used to be good, like people who believe in God and believe in right and wrong, they're now considered evil because they're considered intolerant. Okay?